thank you very much. But what we should do is, before you tell us about yourself, let's just look at what the symposium is about. Is that all right with you? Please do. Do an okay. amazing introduction of the symposium, my friend. No, I don't. But yeah, but the thing is, look, I don't really like to talk so much because I think it'll be a repetition. But basically, the concept being that let's look at indigenous peoples, let's look at how they have been doing mediation. Because I feel that we moved into a direction which is a little too technical, and of course, with the court system, it's coming through the court system. Definitely, I just think that the direction because of that has gone totally i mean into something where you are actually putting a gun to someone's head and saying settle otherwise it's going to take you so many years and so much cost that's not the way we want mediation to go forward we want it to be collaborative we want people to work together to be able to at least understand each other so that's why that world mediation circle of a humanistic approach and of course values based mediation so behind that let's see that what has been happening and you, I don't know whether you know that in September, then we are doing colonization, decolonization and mediation to understand after that what really happened. So yesterday we had this, you came in, you came in, but you left. So this is, of course, recording is on YouTube and the schedule also, I'm going, I'll put a link to my, my, on my website, mediatorvikram.com. So the schedule has all the links to the YouTube, the recordings and everything. So that's yeah. about what I should talk about. Of course, we have the World Mediation Circle. Again, it's on mediatorvikram.com. I won't take time for that. So, Luis, it's you and Indigenous Peoples and Mediations. So, thank you very much and please. Thank you, my friend. And thank you for, for all the amazing work you do connecting all mediators around the world. Um, let me share my screen <clears throat> to do something here. Yes, yeah, so you are going to tell us about yourself. Yeah, and, and as you know, it's 10.30 here in Lima, Peru. <laughs> and good morning for you and all the people on that side of the world, that part of the world. So um, I'm going to share a case uh, of, of foreign investment and indigenous people and how uh, I help to go from conflict to a more strategic alliance between these company and the, and the community. Some of our audience uh, and our colleagues know I work with individuals, groups, organizations, governments to use negotiation and consensus building skills and strategies to advance their interests, improve business and working relationships and, and deal with conflict more effectively. <clears throat> so this is our world with a lot of indigenous people all around the world. And we are having an amazing communication between India to your right and Peru to your left. So the case that I'm going to be sharing, it, it is, if the screen moves, but it sometimes get ooh, slow. So it went out, I'm sorry. Okay, let's see if it works. Okay, so some of my work, a lot of my work deals with indigenous uh, peoples and communities. In, in Latin America, here are pictures from Peru since 2011 and 2018 when I did work this work in, in, in Ecuador that I'm going to be sharing with you. And then I had the opportunity to serve the Peruvian government um, in, in a conflict management capacity as a mediator facilitating uh, multiple stakeholders, uh, mediations, dialogues, uh, and so on. So what I'm going to be talking about, as I mentioned, is what I call the Guarinza project case. Uh, it was in Ecuador, and it's a case of foreign investment, a mining project, uh, and dealing with indigenous people. So as I shared, this is Peru. Above Peru is Ecuador. And near the border, you have uh, an area where this conflict happened. And between Peru and Ecuador, we have had uh, many years of conflict. Uh, since 1941, we have had like 50 years of, uh, or five decades of, of conflict because of seven, 78 uh, kilometers uh, that was on, on dispute in this border. And we have a very rough situation in 1941, then 1980, one and then 90, 
1995. And then in 1998, uh, the Peruvian president and the uh, president from Ecuador, they reached an agreement, a peace agreement in, in Brazil. And one of the lines that they divide uh, or they put the, these kind of stones dividing the limits between Peru and Ecuador is that one where I'm standing, obviously many years later, but that's a river and a piece of landscape between Ecuador and Peru. And around that area, we have a Cordillera del Condor are mountains in the jungle of Peru and Ecuador. And there's this um, indigenous community, indigenous people called Shuar. That's a specific, um, um, how can I say this? And a specific nation, how they call themselves. They say we're the Shuar nation, but it's an indigenous uh, people, indigenous community. So there's a, a mining company who um, got obtained the rights to do exploration. And those are the rights of the land under the surface. But then the community was owner of the, the surface of the land. And then supposedly there was a, a purchase of a piece of land and the company acquire or get obtain some of the properties in that area. So there are many, um, many com little communities in this area. There's, um, there are 10,000 individuals of this Shuar in this community. And in 2004, there was this agreement between the community and, and a mining company to do exploration. But that was 2004 and, two, and in 2006, two years later, uh, this is a headline where it says that people from Ecuador deport a, a North American mining company from their territories. And very proudly they say that this day will be remembered forever because they kind of kick out the indigenous or original people from Ecuador, they kick out this mining company. Um, so that was 2006. And after 11 years of conflict in 2017, a community, uh, 10 community leaders of this Shuar community, they came to Peru because in Peru is the headquarters of this mining company. And they came to Peru to ask that the company give that piece of land back to the company. Even though the company purchased it, the community were saying, well, we don't know very much about how this deal was done. So we want this, this piece of land back. And I was called in to help facilitate this conversation that uh, the company was concerned that these 10 leaders of the community, they were coming here. They didn't know what attitude they were bringing to this conversation. And they asked me, the, the company asked me if I could have some brief negotiation training, uh, some kind of dialogue training in order to kind of set the table for a conversation the following day. So I spent two days with this uh, people and the company. And one of the agreements at the end of this meeting, well, the community, these leaders, they understood that the company could not give that, give that piece of land back to the community, but they were willing to, to work together to build some um, development in, in, in the region. And the other agreement was that they said, hey, Luis, meaning me, you need to come to our community to help explain what we did here in this meeting. And we would like you share this negotiation training with the local communities in our community. So uh, this is the area. These are the pieces of, of land. It was a kind of big area. This is where a community is based called Warins and this other community, Warinsa. You need to walk one hour from this point to this point to, the, to get to this 
community. Um, and here are all the, the titles or the properties that were on dispute that were sold to, to this mining company. So they asked me after they left in November, they sent a letter uh, the first week of December, 2017, asking me to go and share what we did uh, in this meeting in Lima and share some uh, strategies or how we can have a, a, a good negotiation with the company. So 2018, they invited me to December and the first week of January, I think was two year, two days after uh, New Year's Day, New Year's Eve. So I was invited to this community to provide some training and to better understand the interest needs and concerns of the community. What in my world means, I, I wanted to do a conflict assessment to understand the real concerns of the communities and what's at stake around this dispute after 11 years of conflict. And I wanted to really understand what the people were feeling, thinking, and, and what was going on in, in this area. So these are the two communities, Warins and Warinza. Here are other Shuar uh, people. As I mentioned, there are like 10,000 people around this area. And this is the border between Peru and, and Ecuador. And in this area, where it, it's, it was a kind of the rights of the company to do exploration. So to give you a sense of that's what it looked like, flying to get to this area. So this community was in the middle of the jungle and there was no other way to arrive that flying for about 40 minutes from a little town to this place. So this is the community where I was supposed to arrive. This was the community. And to give you another sense of the landing, this is the first time I was arriving. And it was a very rough landing, but... but uh, Luis, you also have to tell us what was your heartbeat at this time? I was almost dying. <laughs> <laughs> I spent all the flight praying for my life because it was very very complicated. So that was the landing and, and the people were um, kind of receiving a, those are the little kind of townhouse. And that was it. So I got there. I did really feel like Indiana Jones arriving to this area. That was January, 2018. And the purpose was to share under the, our ideas uh, that or what we did during the training in Lima, this negotiation training, and do this stakeholder assessment in Javi, that's one of the little tiny communities to understand the real grievances and potentially craft a proposal that the community to that the community could send to the company called Lowell. So it was a deep process of understanding between uh, like the purpose was to have a better understanding between the company and the community. I'm sharing here some, some information about the training, how people think, how people engage, the attitude, are we being competitive? Are we trying to be more collaborative? So this was uh, the, the area where I was uh, working on or sharing this. At the end, everybody was happy. We share a meal. And here you have a little tiny picture that I have in bigger, and it's called Sansa, because when I got there, they told me, hey, do you know what Sansa? We shrink the heads of our enemies. And I guess I feel very welcome when they said, well, we don't shrink the heads of bold people. And they kind of start making fun. And well, this is a picture of this, Head already shrink, and this is a picture of my kids, and 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 actually a, a display in a in a museum two weeks ago that I was spending time with my kids in in the United States. But anyway, so we had this great conversation, these two or three days with the community, listening people cry, scream, 
a lot of um, grievances, pain, suffering for, for the situation, um, a lot of misunderstanding. And the community said, well, we want to talk with the company, but we can have a, a, a dialogue process, but first we need to have a prior consultation process, which is a process under the law or the 169 um, ILO convention, the Interna International, Labor, International Labor Organization. Um, but they said that the, that the company must commit to give back these uh, titles of, of the property to the, to the community. So they said, we can talk, but first give us the land you own us because, well, we saw it, but we were not sure how that was done. So you just give us the land back and then we can start talking. But that was the idea. And, and then we can participate in a dialogue process, uh, work in a development plan for the community. And we also want a compensation or an indemnity to the communities uh, for the dam damages and suffering caused by this problem. The thing is that the, 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 this indigenous uh, community, they have a different relation with the land. It's not like a more occidental view of, well, that's a property, we purchase the property, we use it, we sell it, we it's something that is just as external, it's an asset, and that's how also companies look at it. But in this case, they live on that area. So they say that it's kind of their, their land is, is not only their Walmart, the big grocery store where they go and buy buy or obtain all the, 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 the things that they need to live, but they also say that the land is kind of part of them. It's an extension of their bodies. It's, it's some other communities around from the same, uh, the same Shuar community, other kind of little, I would not say towns, but little community, little gathering of people, they were saying, hey guys, you sold the land. That means that you are not a, a full completely sure anymore. So we may go get rid of you guys and take the land back with our own hands. So this community was um, scared, a lot of times scared because they were saying, well, maybe our brothers, our cultural brothers are coming and taking the land back and they are going to kill us all. So for that reason, they were saying, well, this selling deal is, it caused all this damage and fear in the community. So the idea was for me, they gave me the, the mission to go to talk with the company and explain this, uh, this proposal. And then I went back to Lima, I talked with the manager of the company and I, I, I explained what they were, the community were uh, proposing and they told me, well, this gentleman told me this needs to be reviewed by the we Canadian executives because this company was owned by, by a Canadian company. And, and after a few days, he told me that they were, they were open to have a dialogue process in which all issues could be addressed. So when we were in Lima, they said, we cannot talk about this property as an asset, but now we can talk about it. But in, within the dialogue process, well, the community were saying, well, first give me the land back and then we can talk. So in February, the following month, I was supposed to go back to the community and tell them what was the, the response from the company. Uh, so I went <laughs> and then I informed uh, what the community, what the company thought about the, the proposal from the community and that we can, the company say, we can talk, we can have a fair process. We can talk about all the issues. And that was one of the purposes. And then I also wanted to, 
keep collecting information, gathering information to understand more deeply what were the interests, the concerns, the hopes, the worries, aspirations. And I did a, a, a visioning exercise. So I asked the community in order to maybe to set up the stage, if we, I said something like, stop thinking for a moment that if there were not conflict with the company, would it be possible for you, community and the company work together and see a future together? And if the company were able, was able to, to help bring some development, how would that look like? So we did this visioning expert uh, exercise. Uh, I did some drawings and, but the company kept saying, we want to send you a new proposal. But first you need to, the company needs to return the title. And then we can talk about benefits, the, the mining project and, and whatever you want. But first you need to heal the relationship. You need to heal uh, the wounds that cause this, this, this drama, this, this situation. And in that, in that conversation, I explained to them that dialogue is a process in which people can talk, but there are some preconditions to have a dialogue uh, or a working premises, which are not everyone is going to be super hyper, 100% happy, uh, but indeed, well, there's no perfect solution, but everybody needs to be better than what they were before. Uh, also, that's another premise is that they need to think if they really need each other, meaning can they do things better together than by themselves? And then it's also important that they reflect if that not everybody knows everything, meaning there are things from the community that the company uh, doesn't know. And obviously there are things about the company that the community doesn't know. So it's an opportunity to, to, to learn together about, about the situation and about the future that they can have together. So this was a vision and exercise that we had with the community, working with a lot of uh, post-its. And then the result of this visioning exercise had to do with health issues, education, infrastructure, housing, energy. They want internet, they want to build roads, they want to improve or industrialize their local products. And we draft another proposal to go back to the company and say, well, this is what the community is saying. We want a community development plant. We are willing to, to, to have a plan for the mining project, doing exploration and exploitation, but you need to socialize or inform everybody about this, this project, not only our community, but also other organizations or larger organizations that gather many of these Shuar community. There's this PESHA or PSHA, that is a kind of federation of Shuar centers of different communities uh, that gather many, many of this population. They also talk about the, con the, the prior consultation process they were saying, well, we can, maybe we can give you a, an exploration permit for seven years. And they start talking about other, other, other proposals. So I went back to Peru, but before I went going back to Peru, I also had the opportunity to talk with some uh, public officials uh, in, the, in the Ecuadorian government. And they were open to mining uh, but they had to do it in a more responsible way. So that was February. And in March, I had the opportunity to go to Canada to talk with some of the executives of this mining company to learn about well, what they know about the situation in, in Ecuador, also to learn about their interests and aspirations and, and see if there are some 
options to develop and see and think together if, if there's some creative thing we can do in order to, to address or satisfy the interests of, of all the parties involved here. For me, it was also an opportunity to learn about some of the business and, and, and experiences of the First Nations in Canada, which are also indigenous people, and, and other, other, other participants in, the, in, this, in this conference in Ecuador. In, I'm sorry, in Canada. So I met the executive from Canada and other people also from, from Ecuador. Um, yeah, these are some of those pictures. I met with some uh, Canadian executives. And from my meeting with the, with the Lowell executives, I learned about the interests of the company I explained the current situation and what they, what the community wanted or the interest. I also wanted to learn about the, the, the decision, the decision making process, because if the community wanted that the company give the land back to the community, um, I wanted to know how the decision making process and how the company should proceed if they were willing to give this piece of land back. So I was wondering what has to happen so they can decide what to do with the current title or the, or the property land. So by the end of my trip to Canada, I had a better understanding of, I knew about the interests of Javi, of this community, it was an identity issue, the, the land title conflict, and they also wanted to be in a better position, better situation. They wanted to get some development. And the company's interest, they wanted to do exploration. They want to construct and exploit some this mining, this mining project uh, with, with high good standards and the, um, they really wanted to learn also about what was the problem with the with the community so what they really care about the community so i also wanted to know the concerns and aspirations of of this fesha this federation that i mentioned that gathers all these short centers um and they also wanted to talk with this community, these, these groups of communities that supposedly represent a larger group of people. So they, the company also wanted to contribute it to the development of these communities. And that was in alignment with Javi's interest. So Considering the interests of the company, considering the interests of, of, of Javi, of this community, I kind of draft a, a proposal that I could take to the community and tell them, what if you share these ideas with the, with the company? So I, I, I pretend to craft some sort of ideas or options that could bring the company and the community together to, to, to work something out. So I was going back March 2018 to explain, well, this might be an opportunity and these are some of the ideas. But when I got there to this little town to take my little airplane to go to a little community, I ran into this individual uh, and he was the president of this Pesha organization I mentioned is, is, is a, an a federation of, of Schwarz centers. And he said, well, you are not authorized to get into my communities. So I had the dilemma to enter or not to enter. But the people from the community was, uh, they were waiting for me. So what should I do? Should I go in or not? Or 
I had to decide where I go in or not. So I said to him, I highly respect your authority, uh, your hierarchical way to organize your, your communities. And I didn't know about you. I mean, I didn't have the opportunity to, to talk with you, but actually I'm coming back from Canada talking with this company and they want to talk with you because they want to talk with this federation. So, but respecting your position, I said, I will know, I will not go into the community, but perhaps we can get together uh, later, later next month, if I can bring the, the people from the company uh, from Canada. And he said, okay, let's stay in touch and maybe we can get together. So in April 2018, the Canadian company sent uh, an, um, um, a new country director for Ecuador, and he came wanting to have a, a, the, he wanted to know the team of of the workers with this with this mining company that that actually was not doing much work, but they wanted to do work, but he wanted to know. What, what they were doing, how did everything started, and, 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 and that was it. So in that, the, the same day, we had, I had the opportunity to connect with this gentleman, the, the, the president of this special organization, and, and I, I introduced them, and I said, well, these guys from Canada, they came here, they want to know about you, they want to know about your organization, and they are interested in going inside the community and explain what the company is really thinking and what the company wants to do. And so the president of this organization, he said, well, you can go and I will send uh, a, a, a representative uh, from their organization and he can go with you and you can explain what you want to do. So. The next day we went inside the community and this executive, he presented the idea that the company had, the understanding of the community situation. And he kind of did a comparison between how the decision-making process works in a company, comparing that to the, the decision making process in a, in a community. So a month later, after internal conversations between going back and forth between these leaders and, and, the, and, the, and the company, they decide to have a dialogue process in order to clarify the situation between the company, the land and this community. So that was May 2018. We set up kind of roadmap for this dialogue process. We were going to have a high executive commission of, of representative from, from all these uh, entities, the community and the company. And then we were going to have um, uh, meetings on a regular basis. We were going to build capacity and we, we develop a kind of a plan to address the, the concerns of the community. So that was, uh, that was May and in June, the following month, we went in the community to explain the agreement that was reached between the company and these leaders. And the agreement was to, we're going to start having a, a, a dialogue process. And one of the conditions was that after every meeting we have, like the company and the community or the community representatives and this organization, um, we were going inside the community and explain what the meeting was about and if they reach an agreement, just to keep informed and, 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 and allowing the, comp the, the community have a voice in this process and to prevent any miscommunication between uh, kind of the dialogue table 
and the and the, the second tables or the of the communities. So one of the things that the community were saying, as I mentioned, is we want this land back. And the government in Ecuador had to they 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 had a better, better sense of what could be done and what cannot or could not be done. So we put together uh, some representative from the community and this organization, as I mentioned, Pesha and the company, and we went to talk with the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock to explain the problem of the titles and see if there's any potential solution. At the end, they said, well, the community already sold this property. Now the company is the owner of the land. The only way the community can get the land back is if they purchase it or if the company give uh, like a donation, like a gift of this land to the community. And, and at the same time, we did a census in the community in order to understand the real needs, what kind of jobs they were they, they had, what kind of um, things they do with agriculture, do they have animals, do they have, what do they have? We want to have a better assessment of the social economical conditions in the in the, in the in that area. So if the company later on wants to do a development plan they have a better sense of what are the real needs of the community. So in August 2018, we went back to this community and explained the process, uh, what we have done since the beginning of the process. And then the company asked, uh, based on the conversation that we had with the government, the company asked if the community would be willing to accept the land, if, if the company was willing to give the land back to the community, the government said that they need to give the land back or give the land to a community that it has a legal status. Because I mentioned there were two communities. One had a legal status and was uh, acknowledged by the government and the other one was in the process of kind of legalizing their status, but they were not the owners. I'm sorry, they didn't have the, the status, but they were the people who sold the land. So the company said, we maybe, just maybe we can give you the land back, but if we give you the land back, we are not going to give the land back to the individuals that sold the property to us, but to the other members of the community that are in, in, the, in, the, in the community that is more or has this legal status. And at the end of that conversation or that big meeting, it was a little chaotic, but they said, yes, we want the land back, even <clears throat> if it goes to the hands of these, our brothers, uh, and then we will figure out. Uh, in that session, it was very interesting because they switched their names uh, because they wanted to have the, the community that didn't have the legal status. They wanted to have the name of the legal, the, the community that had the legal status. And then the other community uh, got the name of the mining project. But this later on was, um, was uh, it was a little confusing. And then they said, oh, well, we're going to back to our original names. Well, in August, uh, the, com the company presented a letter confirming that the company had decided to transfer the ownership of the land to this community, the one that has the legal status. And at the, in, at the same time, the Ecuadorian government had to do some work or need to do some verification in the region, in the area to see if the company was working or not. And then we uh, had the opportunity to help the company, help the government to get into the community in order to, 
to verify that they were using, that they were not working and they were not using or polluting water. And, and that was part of, part of the process. So in September, the company had an old meeting within this dialogue process. And it was also an opportunity to explain the Aboriginal Economic Development Corporations of Canada, explaining how in Canada, if sharing the experiences of Canada that indigenous community can work with mining companies or other companies and, and, and get some development. And they also explained that the the process of giving the land back, it was going to take a little longer than they were expecting because there was some confusion in the, in the public records. So then we had an opportunity in October, um, the community and the company, they were very proud of this process. And they said, we want to talk with the government. We want to explain to the Ministry of Mining, uh, the process we are following and that we are going to get our land back and they wanted to invite the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture. And it was a, a, a preparation session to go to, to talk with the public officials. We went to talk with the public officials uh, to talk with this, the Ministry of Energy and Non-Renewable Renewable Natural Resources. Later on, this changed to name of, of Ministry of Mining, Energy and Mining. Um, and kind of we start talking with the government, preparing the, the, the condition to, to get the government more involved in this process. And at the same time, we, are doing, we were doing these workshops to identify uh, more needs and problems in the communities. So, because if one, we wanted to develop a, a, a development we want to work on a development plan for to benefit the community. We really needed to know what the community really cares about. And that was some exercises that we did. And at the end, we prioritized the result of this. And there, are, there were many items or topics that they wanted to address. Um, and in November, finally, we talked with the Ministry of, of Energy and Non-Renewable energy and uh, natural resources in, in Quito, the capital of Ecuador. We explained the process and we invited, we invited him to, to go to, to a ceremony that we were going to organize in order to, to, to get the, the property back to the community. But, but so Luis, you, said, Luis yes. you, skipped, you skipped some slides. I know it's late for you, but it must be important the ones you skipped. You know. what, what before, slides? Before that, you I think you skipped some. Before that, was there something that you skipped? No. no. Okay. I mean, I didn't read all these details. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, okay, let's have a look. I mean, I just it, look, everything that you're saying is so important. You don't realize this, but this is really important for the world to know that this you actually went through this entire process. You can understand this is a problem everywhere. So I'm just think, <laughs> thinking that you should take people through everything that you put down there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my friend. Well, um, and actually, um, the government had to give the permit for the company to do to work on exploration. And actually, the the community were saying, well, there's no formal prior consultation process in Ecuador for mining projects. And, and, and they said, you can do a pilot with us. So you can start doing this prior consultation process with our project. And they were kind of getting a, a sense of ownership of all this process on, of what was going on. Um, so in 2018, they had this, this the ceremony and we call the, what the signing of the contract for the donation of the Lowell, uh, for the Lowell land to the community and the celebration of the restitution of these titles without any conditions. Meaning the company said, the company understood that if they give the land back to the community, we know conditions, 
meaning you don't need to give me anything. I will just give you the land. They were going to start a healing process and the community may see with better eyes the company and the company can have more, a better face with the community. And it was, they were kind of, I believe they were genuine and that's why I was uh, helping uh, fostering this, this dialogue process. So then we have this a uh, big, uh, the declaration of Warinsa, the victory of dialogue. And actually I wrote this based on our meeting in which everybody were sharing their ideas of from the community and from the company, what we should write in a, in a victory speech for dialogue. And that was what we, we posted. So that was November and the following months in New Year Eve, no, Christmas Eve, um, Lowell present uh, a proposal for a memorandum of understanding to the communities and to, to organization, this organization Pesha that I mentioned, it's like the Federation of the Schwar, the centers, uh, the Schwarz centers. And they present a proposal saying, this is what we would like to do. Uh, please have a moment to read it, review it, and we can have a meeting next month and, and see what's your reaction. Um, so this potential, this memorandum of understanding, it was also including many of the ideas, interests and options that were, that came up during this dialogue process. So the next year, January, in, in, in the little town of Macas, this, um, the, the High Commission, the Dialogue Commission, we got together. They also invited the Ecuadorian government and they explained that they wanted to do this consultation process. And they start reviewing and modifying this proposed memorandum of understanding. And, and the community said, the leaders of the community, they said, well, we are reviewing this and we are going to take back to the community and we are inviting you, company, the January uh, 23rd to the community and, and we will give you a, a, an answer or response to your proposal. January 23, 2018. And that day they were invited to the community and the memorandum of understanding was uh, signed. So Longwell was invited to the community to be part of this general assembly. And now they have the two communities uh, getting together and, and they, they signed this agreement that the purpose was, we are going to do a joint study of the subsoil because we want to understand what's the value that is under the surface of, of our communities. Um, in, then in February, then the following months, uh, the president of, of Pesha, this gentleman, he invited the company uh, to a session of this federation in order to explain what was the dialogue process like, how the, the donation of the 26, how, how they gave back to the community. Uh, then they explained the, the memorandum of understanding and what was going to, what was the meaning of that? What was the purpose of that? And then the govern, governing council supported the dialogue process and the decision of the president of this organization to sign, uh, to join this agreement uh, or, or this letter of understanding as, as a witness of honor of this memorandum of understanding. So in the agreement, also the government participated as a, as a as guarantee, guarantee of, of this agreement, but the agreement had like two points. It was a, an agreement to carry out subsoil study 
and 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 in and the company the community we're going to get these benefits of for for being part of this this study so this was framed as a joint fact finding process or a joint investigation and they were going to have this consultation and monitoring committee to verify the compliance with the commitments and to advise the company on the community's per perspective. And they also constituted an environmental monitoring committee made up of members of the Warrens and, and Javi communities that will monitor and verify that, that the study of the subsoil does not affect the environment or doesn't bring, bring any pollution. And there were other um, elements of disagreement. There was going to be a development fund. They were going to hire uh, people from the community. The company planned and designed a training program for jobs during these studies. And, and then the company, with the help of the community, they select uh, they, this uh, selection process. And at the end, they trained 40 people from this Warinsa in, in February of 2019. Um, this agreement was very important because it empowered the community. Because if the community decided, uh, if they wanted, they could suspend this memorandum of understanding at any time. So the company empowered the community say, saying, if you want, we leave at any time, you just let us know and we will leave. Um, and then they were not going to do some kind of uh, phase three subsoil study, which is big, the big, big drills and drill the, the ground. Uh, they were not going to do that until they have permission of the government. And, 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 and that, that was another commitment of the company. That was January 2018. Uh, and then in 2020, we fast forward. Uh, in January 2020, just before the pandemic, the, the bloody COVID started, they came to Peru because in Peru we have more experience with mining projects, but they wanted to share with uh, mining organizations, engineers organizations, and other, and other stakeholders group. They want to share their experience with this dialogue process and how they end up having this um, consultation monitoring committee that then changed the name for being a, an advisory board of the Wanisa project. So they came to Peru to share more, to share about their, their dialogue process and to learn more about mining uh, and how that, that's done. And, and, and I help, well, we, I, with my colleagues, I, we prepare a, a, a program that we call it From Fear to Value in Mining uh, in order to explain how mining, how the, the mining process, how to prevent that ones get impacted, how can you obtain the benefits of these projects? And then and then we 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 expose them to to other uh, um, areas where they could learn more about mining, more kind of hands-on experience. This this not this is not a real mine. But it was like a not a museum, not an amusement park, but you had a you had the opportunity to see a little flavor of 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 what's what's a mine and how it works. And when they went back to Ecuador, it was the first uh, drilling machine arriving to the area, and they were already um, uh, trained. And they start working on 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 the area. Then we had a kind of a second tour of other new members of 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 the advisory board of these Warinsan and and Javi Shuar communities of Ecuador. 
they came to Peru to learn more about mining. And in March, they went to Canada to explain what was, um, what was the process that they had, how they reached an agreement with this, with this company. And actually they also met a public official from the Ministry of Mining in Ecuador or Mines in Ecuador. And they also met uh, the Taltan native people, which has, are indigenous people from Ecuador, the, the, from Ecuador, from Canada, the First Nations in Ecuador. And they also learn about the, these Aboriginal Economic Development Corporations and how they take advantage or grow together with the companies. And, and they learn about these, these, these strategic alliances uh, with business and companies that work in different areas, uh, properties, development, economic, in the, this develop economic independence for these indigenous and, and native communities in Canada. So the idea was that the, the, the native uh, in Ecuador learn about these experiences in Canada. So we fast forward a few months and now they are working on this project doing exploration. They are having uh, results of what they are identifying uh, on, on the subsoil. And even though the company have a good relationship with these two communities, there are other communities in the surrounding areas that they are saying, Hey, uh, they are kind of speaking up saying, this Canadian company is taking advantage of these poor indigenous people that they don't know what's going on. So they were doing some, a, a public conference, some NGOs, Amazon Watch and Mining Watch start saying some things. And, and these two communities send an open, open letter saying, um, saying to, to the NGOs, Amazon Watch and Mining Watch, please don't, don't get in, in, don't speak for us. Uh, let us e exercise the right to, to free self-determination or autonomy. So they, they were actually defending the relationship or the strategic alliance that they were building or they built with the mining company. And last month, the, the Ministry of Mining actually was visiting that area, uh, those communities in this project. And then I wrote a piece uh, about it, obviously it's in Spanish, but I wrote this Modelo Guarinza, and I explained this, this process, how, how it happened. And if I can share my nine lesson learns in a few minutes, just on the top of the hour, um, the power of word choice um, is, is something that once and again, I realize that, well, word choice is powerful because we do not frame this as a exploration. It's a mining exploration. Just because when you mention exploration, people think about exploitation, meaning we are taking all the minerals and we are making us rich based on the minerals we are taking from the ground. But it was, this was more like a study of, or an investigation of the subsoil to actually determine the potential of minerals or the economical benefits and what was the value of these, um, of these resources under the surface. Uh, and it was, as I mentioned, done uh, jointly. So listening to the other is the first step to start building and rebuilding trust. One must be genuine in listening with the purpose of sincere understanding and learning about the other. Um, taking the risk to trust the other, make it easier for the other to trust one. That's kind of difficult, but that's what it works. And beyond cultural differences, this process that we apply, this consensus building, this joint fact finding, and this mutual gains approach, 
does actually help to facilitate understanding between the parties and, and creating va value. And positive relations, uh, relationships and human connection facilitate the generation of collaborative and a collaborative environment uh, to dialogue based on interest and, and mutual, with mutual gains. And cre credibility is built little by little, but with the fulfillment of promises. So you need to actually do what you said you were going to do. You need to walk the talk. If you are saying you are going to do X, Y, and Z, you gotta do it. You have to do it. And the strategic design of a dialogue process based on interests and mutual gains and stakeholder activity, active participation and engagement achieve positive results because the parties feel and make the process uh, their own. I mean, to get your buying, but people feel that this process is, is they build together this process. And using a, a mediator or a third party, uh, since early stages of a dialogue process with local communities creates good conditions to have deep, open, honest conversations. And finally, the commitment of the executive with the within the company uh, with the genuine interest of having a sincere dialogue process and sharing power and control with the community is essential for, for the success, success of any dialogue process. And if you have seen me doing a presentation before, this is one of my favorite quotes because Peter Drucker, uh, kind of father of management, modern management, he says that cultural culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that means in my world that it's useless to have the right tools and processes or strategies if we have the wrong paradigm or the wrong way of thinking or the wrong culture. So let's think about mutual gains and that's what I have, my friend, Pika. I look, I am alo alone here, but look, just think I'm giving you a standing ovation because I love the work that you're doing and we have to do it everywhere. But of course, Luis, there will be questions. So I know it's late for you, but there are things. When you talk about the timeline, the first time that the sale took place till the process and everything, what was the, the whole thing? They sold the property in 2004. In 2000, and they were doing some exploration, basic exploration work. In 2006, the community kicked out the company. And then you had 11 years of tension and conflict. And in 2017, the people, the leaders from the community, they came to talk with the, the manager of the company saying, hey, give us the land back. And that's when they said, well, we maybe we need to have a deeper conversation. So that's where I went there. And that was 2000. I, I got to that community in January 2018. And the agreement, the, the first agreement was reached in January 2019. So it was a year of... of every two weeks uh, meetings and, and, and having deep conversations and working together and yeah. So it was a year of, the dialogue last a year. So first, I mean, the first sale that took place, I mean, how did that work out? Because obviously someone sold it and the company bought from someone thinking that these people are the rightful owners. How did, how did that transaction work? I just want to understand. That well, part. They were the rightful owners, uh, owners. Uh, but I think the company was very interesting because the company has changed uh, leadership, uh, executives, and at that time, they I think they hire a, a, an attorney, a local attorney, and the attorney went there and who knows what he did, but he obtained some contracts, like legal documents, saying that they were selling the property to the company. Um, within the, 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 the sharing of this experience, some people said, well, I signed 
the document, but I didn't know what I was signing. Others may have uh, uh, a better luck saying, well, I read that. I thought it was a good price. I get a little pay. I didn't get paid the rest. But um, the way how it was done, I believe it was crafted by uh, an attorney in, in Ecuador. So mm -hmm. I don't even think that the company didn't really know what was going on. So a company comes to a foreign country, say, hey, I want to buy something. And somebody going to say, OK, I get it for you. And maybe they were surprised as well. Yeah, but these are I mean, the land is individuals, individuals owning land, which is being sold by them. And this guy says, I'll collect land from all of them and I'll give you the thing. Right. So, okay, so that's where I think that's where the issue lies in a lot of countries. I think someone on the local level says that I can manage everything. And then I think obviously it goes out of hand because how it, the whole transaction takes place, what they're promised and everything. Definitely. So I think this is something that we definitely have to look at. I mean, I, I, everywhere I'm, I'm sure it'll be different. But from your end, I mean, in terms of you're coming in, you're coming in as appointed by the... That, that was interesting because I got in. I got in just because the company called me saying, there are some leaders from this community that they are coming to the office and they are going to ask us to give them the land back, the land that we purchased and we are the legal owners. And we don't know how to have the conversation because we don't know uh, what attitude they are bringing. I don't know if they are coming and they are going to hit us or, or, or beat us up or, or what, right? So they asked me, hey, Luis, can you, I don't know, do some, some of this negotiation training magic you do? So, so I, 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 I was introduced to these individuals and we spend a full day, eight hours talking about dialogue, negotiation, and yeah. And so the different the competing and collaborating and working together. And then they had a, I think I also helped them to put in words what they wanted from the company. And that was the first day of training. And then the second day I, I, I helped this conversation flow. So at the end, the company said what they were thinking at that time. Hey, we want to help you develop. We want to work on your area, but we cannot get rid of this land. We cannot give you this land back because it's an asset and the asset for the company has a value because in that way we can obtain more money to do more work. And you have like, like a warranty because you have land and it has some value. But on the other hand, they later on realize that, well, what's the value of this land if I cannot use it? I cannot even, I have right to do exploration, but I cannot go into my piece of land because people don't allow it and I have a conflict. And, and, and the community leaders, they said, well, Luis, we like what you are saying because I frame something like, it's possible to look at the future and see the the horizon uh, and, and, and shining, everybody shining like the community and the company and the government and seeing a better future for all the parties involved. And they asked me, okay, we like that. I, we want you go to our community in the middle of the jungle and you tell our community why we are not giving, we are not bringing the title back to the community and we are bringing these other ideas. So, so that's where, that's why they invited me. And that was an opportunity to learn more about the grievances, to share that with the, com the company and the company reflect and said, yeah, we maybe need to do things differently. Because I'm looking at it from the credibility, I'm just that trust and everything that this person who's from Peru Say, I mean, first time they meet you is in the office of a company, which obviously trust between them is not there. So to develop that, it's a major thing, Luis. I mean, how do you think that you do that? <laughs> is there something that I you don't know? I, need, I think you need to be genuine and you need to be open. 
and and you need to be sincere and honest. And I think we have the little human antennas and we see that. Uh, and, and to me, I was sharing with them, to me it's an honor to be here in this land, which is Ecuador. And I'm a guy from Peru that a few years ago, we had a conflict. Uh, so I was the enemy 10 years ago. And now I'm helping you to talk with these other guys from another country far, far in the north. So, and I think I was able to connect with people because I was sincere, sincerely, genuinely interested in learning about their grievances. So I really wanted to understand what, what, what the heck was going on here. So, well, so I can explain that to the company too. Yeah. too. But this is important because look, that whole, that symposium of mind, heart, soul, spirituality and all that, there is so much more which goes into that. It's not about a process. I'll go this, I'll do X, Y, Z and everything will work out. There is so much more that connecting people and everything. So that I felt that if you, I mean, look, you already said so, but if you want to elaborate a little bit on that, that connection, that energy, all those things that I keep talking about, something, <laughs> because this is a practical aspect of it. Something on that, what, what you felt, how did it Yeah, well, yeah. What can I say? The, the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Come on, tell us about the Wi-Fi. <laughs> the Wi-Fi, yeah. We, we had a great conversation talking about Wi-Fi. It's like how Wi-Fi connects us as, as, as one, as one huge tribe, we are the community, we are the world. And, and so we are humans, we are different colors, different skins, skin colors. But at the end we have, everybody, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to feel appreciated. Everybody wants to feel respected. Everyone wants to have this sense of autonomy that I, I don't want people force ideas or, or things on me. But I also want to have the feeling of affiliation. And, and there's something that really connects us. There's some energy around uh, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, people from India. You have different words. But at, at the end, it's like something is surrounding us and connecting us. And, 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 and of course, for the, for the Star Wars fans, the force is kind of hold the world together right so yeah. that's why that's why it's really important really important with this aspect of it but in terms of language is the i mean language was not an issue it's an issue and actually i was i was having having a meeting this morning uh with some a group of people and there was this little lady tiny lady and she was speaking quechua which is a language from the andes in peru and, and at least people in our field knows that there are some things that you cannot express in Spanish what you can express in this Quechua language because it's more emotional language. Um, so yeah, language is important. Uh, it would be better if we talk the same language. But when I was going to this community, they didn't speak Spanish. They had their own language. Some of them spoke Spanish, uh, but they had their own language and, and not everybody understood what I was saying. So I had to have a translator uh, and I had actually two translators, one who expressed what I want to deliver as a message and the other one translating what the community was saying to me. Um, but as, 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 as you know, most of our, our communication is non-verbal communication. So it's body language and it's, yeah, it's your eyes, it's your smile, it's your, your I don't know, your seriousness. It's, yeah. Sincerity. Sincerity yeah. to the process, sincerity to the community. I mean, those are issues that which can only be a connection, which is the Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But in terms yes. of, yeah, yeah, you're saying something. No, 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 I was going to say, I, I read somewhere that honesty is the best policy and it's a quote that I like. But, yeah. but I think, yeah, I will think, I will, now I, on I will mention honesty as the best policy and, and Wi-Fi connect us. 
I mean, it may sound silly if I, we say to somebody who doesn't know the context of what we are talking about, but kind of, yeah. No, it's good. What, what that little clip that you took out from our discussion, I think kind of explains the whole thing. I mean, the yeah. which people, because these are things which are there, but not, I don't think even science has words for these things. So people should know that there is a lot more which is happening there. But in terms yeah. of the community now, are we seeing an inclusive aspect of it? Or like, I mean, let's look at it from the women or the other influencers in the community. How do you take all those, all that together? What, what do you mean? Look, in the community, one is, of course, these community leaders who come out and, of course, you're there with them. But obviously, at the back, there are a lot of people who are the influencers. So now you have to definitely take everyone into account. And, of course, also on the other end, please tell us about how the role of women in the entire process. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because, yeah, the whole gender issue is is, is very interesting because... I think men knows know that women women have have more power than they think they have, and and we kind of as 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 men we obey more than what they think if we put it male and females, um, but in the community. The leaders are the ones who try to guide the, the, the whole community, but at the end is the community the one that think and speak up. Um, it's, they, they, it's a very, they make decisions, uh, they have a very interesting kind of decision-making process because everybody talks, everybody speaks, everybody has a voice, and then suddenly, somehow, the united voice comes out. So, yeah, I cannot say much. It's, you need to see it happening, and it's like, no. wow, yeah. Exactly, because I mean, talking, to, getting the right people to talk to directly sometimes would also help because I'm sure they have things to say which definitely the community leaders might not put across but to explain to them maybe sometimes a direct communication will also be required so I'm sure you were definitely looking at that but tell me I mean in terms of this president of the Pisha whatever that organization he seems to have come out as someone who suddenly became important in the process how did that work and then how did you handle that well He's very, because of his position, he was very respected by this community. And, and then, you see, that's, that's what, what I, I think when he felt included in the process, he became a very powerful voice. Uh, I think he realized that the company had good intentions and 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 he helped to 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 manage this process i would say that they they also facilitate the process from from that perspective um and actually nowadays he's the he has an important role in in the board of this 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 strategic alliance so he stopped working with the pesha because his period finished and then he started working within the community and helping facilitate understanding between the community and the company. Because as I see, he did not really have, I mean, he wasn't really taken into account earlier and definitely this could have gone into any direction. So to be right. able to realize this and bring him on board and then take it forward, I think that seems to be an important part of what happened. So that, yeah, yeah. So getting, that's what I'm saying, getting the right people and getting them to be part of the process seems to be something that's important. But tell me, Luis, yeah. It, yeah, you're saying something. No, no, I was just going to say sometimes people uh, fear those who are expressing opposition against a project, but sometimes those who express opposition, they express opposition because they have not given a chance to be heard. When they have a voice, 
they could become your your best allies which is which is exactly what we talk about the mediator to be able to communicate with everyone and see where whom to con communicate with on an individual basis maybe you just might have lunch with him or somewhere sitting there in some cafe or some place and connect right. that they so so now sometime might not be the whole community maybe individuals to create that relationship i mean people maybe don't realize what all a mediator really goes through so you have to tell us louis what all you went through this is of course on a overview your emotions right from day 1 onwards and how it went a little bit on that part well i flew from peru to quito i was like two and a half hours regular normal flight i got to quito then in, i jumped into a car somebody else was driving but i was in a car for 8 hours then i got to this little community little town and and then i got to this little airport but it's not an airport it's like a road with few little tiny airplanes then i jumped into this little airplane and did fly for 40 minutes and it was super shaky and everything is green so if the airplane hits the ground you will never see that plane again because kind of the trees eat it is like crazy is is crazy and i was like oh my god what am i doing here am i sure that i want to be here oh my god i was praying all remembering all my jesuit school education and all the praise and holy father and well then i arrived there and i was like okay now what right uh so people approach you and then when i had the first meeting and people started screaming and crying i mean people saying having a lady saying i will never accept this company because i lost my company i i lost my son because of this company i was like okay thinking tell me more and she said something like i sold a uh, a land a piece of land and my son um uh regret that i did that so much that he said mom you are not sure anymore i don't want to be your son anymore so i will leave this town because what you did with this company so it's like you sold your you sold your soul oh, to oh, the oh. devil right it's like and she was like i lost my son so i can and 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 listening and and learning about all these kind of deep emotions it was it was tough it was it was difficult uh but you have to be there and you need to listen and maybe you can uh yeah lose a little uh yeah. fear but it is very emotional and just the facts that how is it going with the ups and downs on that and so that part of it i'm sure you, i mean of course those that happened but if there is something that you want to talk about because the mediator's emotions sometimes people do not look at they everyone talks about the party's emotions and everything so right right but for instance at the end we went to a little little cabin and and i had a drink with some other people from the area and but a drink that is like pure alcohol with some fruit and it was like okay i'm i'm feeling better now <laughs> but tell me bulu is now let's look at it from the company's perspective first of all how did they end up identifying this space that that's one part that's a really good question because there's a, a guy called um don't remember his name but his last name is lowell the name of the company and this guy he was like i don't know the jack custo of exploring minds because he has ident- he has become very famous david lowell his name he has identified so many potential kind of areas where i see there's a big potential mine minerals here and they explore and they they sold a lot of value so he identified that i don't know how he did it but he organized a company or he sold 
that idea to somebody, but they start, I, I don't know exactly how they end up in that area. So I just knew I had enough information to say, here's a problem, let's do something here. Yeah, because finally, we have, to, we have to be fair. Now, in terms of whatever resources these companies have to identify the value of resources in every part of the world, I think that aspect of it, maybe, I don't know, whoever has to do it, if the government has to do it, identify it. And, because now, look, on one side, we have to also look at the whole, let's call it neo-colonization. These companies are huge and their relationship with governments on a different level. So, I mean, here we have to look at how they can, governments can work with people and let's look at people first and identify resources and then first have those arrangements with those communities. Then let companies come in later. The only thing is it's a reverse kind of thing. I don't know what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. yeah, I used to say that the, you should, the, the government should, uh, one of the things that the government should do is empower people with knowledge about their rights, about their, their, their rights and, and obligations with the community, with the company, with the government. Uh, and also they need to develop some sort of ground rules for engagement, uh, like a protocol of respecting customs. So let's say the government goes to a local community. If the government says, well, maybe there's a potential of mineral here. If a company comes, how should they behave while interacting with, with you as a community? So some of those things can start building some respect uh, or prevent situations of yeah, mistreating. And, because yeah, what I'm looking at is that the role of mediators, not when there is a dispute, but when as people to facilitate this whole conversation to again look again it's a matter of being fair and reasonable with communities and once you do that right at the initial stage then when you get a company in at least the communities are of course they understand the overall thing but look we are talking about a lot of the there might not be so much education in those areas for them to know how to look at the value of something and what what they, what they're actually sitting on so I right, think that, right. that so I don't know whether it is corruption in governments which is which affects things or is that changing I mean let's I don't know because that I think seems to be one major issue because if the people in the government are looking to making money out of it for their personal gains they will never take they never give the communities the entire picture I that's what I'm looking at it so can yeah we, yeah can, well so sometimes the government has so much corruption that the companies should be the ones saying okay. Let's forget about the government. Let's deal directly with the community and do the right thing or the good thing. It's good business. It's good business to do the good thing. So, yeah. Only well, thing we know that they, if they do that, there will be whatever hurdles being put by governments. And then, like you said about the NGOs, everyone wants a piece of the cake. <laughs> everyone wants something out of it. So I think that part of it also different people coming in at different times and in some way I mean affecting the process and taking it I mean creating those hurdles I don't know how you discussed it in Canada but did you see that happening here in Ecuador that some external organizations are coming in and creating these communication gaps or whatever yeah there are yeah. I think they are everywhere. They are in Ecuador. They are in Peru. You have good NGOs. You have not so good NGOs. There's there's everything for everybody. No, because that role, that role also you are playing to explain if the community had that much trust in you, so the, for to, to be able to tell them, look, this is good and this is bad. This is right. not good yeah. for you. This is not. This is good for you. What they're saying. At, at least you present the information, right? Yeah. But now look, looking at it from the company's perspective, I mean, did you see them as what I would call, like I said, the attitude of a colonizer or they really wanted to genuinely work with the community? Uh, in this case, with this company, I genuinely believe that they wanted to do the right thing and not kind of colonize, but um, do their work, do what they want to do, 
and get the people in a better situation than they were before they came. So For that I think, no, but you spoke about the Taltan nation. Now that that I mean, do are we going to get some people from there into the symposium? I don't know. Good question. <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can do something. Yeah, yeah. Because, because the yeah, other yeah, people, yeah. Yeah, we need. I think we should get that because, of course, that experience is something which is important for us to understand. Because you've seen a yeah. lot of that, so anyway. But but yeah. let me now, if you're from the point of the community, the development priorities, the model of a developed community was that put across to them. Look, this is what it is going to look like. This is the vision we have for your community, and these are things which. Yeah. No, we we didn't say. This is the vision that we have for your community. We just said, okay, do you have uh, safe water, secure water? Do you have uh, sewage? You don't have sewage. You don't have uh, roads. You don't have electricity. Uh, your school has like two classrooms. Um, so identify what they really need, like basics. And, and then what are all those needs? And then once we identify those needs, what are the priorities? And we, we did something called uh, multi-voting, which is we gave every individual in that group uh, like five post-it, five stickers. And you had listed all the, the needs. And, and I told them, hey, you have five stickers. So you go to the front and put one sticker in, in, in each of the needs that are important for you. If there's one that is super, super important, you can put the five stickers on that one. So they, everybody got up, they were having fun, they were laughing, they put in stickers. And at the end, you, you can get a uh, step back and have a big, uh, visually, you can see what's important for them. Yeah, I'm just thinking that with today we have such, I mean, in terms of creating animation and even VR or everything, maybe a model where they can, look, one is you talking about it. One is they can see, look, this is how a community would look with this kind of houses and this kind of school and whatever other things that you want to bring in that, like you said, their their own priorities, but to actually put it down into something, do you think that sounds something that can be done, should be done? I, I think it should be done, but based, I mean, built with the community. There's some, there's a process called charrette that engineers or architects use it to even develop cities, but with the community and with the yeah. interests of the community. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's like a participatory design planning process. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that would be very uh, useful. That's inter interesting that you said that. Because look, in terms of external experts coming in, who are the people you think should be brought in? Like you said, this is interesting to bring in someone who can, or a, a whole architectural aspect of it. And of course, looking at community needs and putting it all together. So that's one kind of person. Was there anyone else that you thought, was, I mean, should have been brought in or was brought in? At some point of point of time, I would like to see um, people with expertise in psychology, uh, because I feel people needs to be more confident, and you need to build. I don't know if it's more self esteem, but somehow that thing needs to be addressed. Because if you don't believe that you can accomplish something, you will never accomplish it. So you be, you need to believe that you. Not that you deserve it as an entitlement that, okay, I will rest here and wait for the government to fix my problems, but you need to believe that you can do something. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's a, it's a very deep kind of conversation. Yeah. I mean, in terms of anyone else you think needs to be part of this process, any experts to be brought in? My friend, it's past midnight here. I know, I know exactly. I, that's why I was. I mean, look, look. What you don't, you don't realize. Like I've always been saying, 
that this is important work and of course time has peg look you were a late night person so it should not be okay last question let's deal we'll get into that how do you look at these relationships on an ongoing basis do you think there should be some kind of a joint exploration and profit sharing with communities should that be a model what what model would you look at um i think participation is is the key uh but real genuine in, inclusiveness um doing things together uh so i think people need to think together and do things together uh having experiences together is not oh i do exploration and then i share share information it's important to share information but what if we dig in together uh we review reports together so I think people needs to be part on uh, on the part of the process to if you are part of the process is more likely that you accept or or are part of the result but, I mean. but, but, but dealing with the community and the company do you think that this was something that they would also both be open to what I mean yes yes of course yes the well, only thing the only thing i'm seeing in that is because there is going to if there is money coming in in that sense in within the community do you think they would it would create a different kind of a uh, environment and uh, something there like? yeah that's why uh, when 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 i mentioned that they were offering jobs and they were building capacity to do the jobs the jobs were there are not like i don't know I, maybe the community have like 500 people you don't have 500 positions but you can have i don't know 50 but you rotate and you have one position and several people from the community start working on that right so there are ways to to bring um i don't know if equal but balance grow Right. Because, I tell you, this is where I was talking about the colonizer aspect. Because the colonizer's way was divide and rule. So I see that in some parts of India, where the companies have gone in and, of course, made private arrangements with each individual. So one who was offered a job now gets us financially in a certain position. So creates a, a different. Let's call it class distinction between the community. Kind of divides the community there. i mean that part of it is also i'm sure happening in parts of parts of the world so yes yes indeed actually there are companies that run approach but they give money and build entrepreneurs uh or help become uh entrepreneurs to the people that were the loudest screaming against the company okay and there's a difference between building individual business and building a community business there's something called empresa comunal like communal company in peru and and in ecuador that what we were kind of proposing which is similar to the canadians economic development um corporations is the whole community owns this company is not the one or two or three guys in the in the community owns a company and they provide services or part of the supply chain with the company is like there's a company that is owned by the community they provide services and the revenues are distributed equally to all the community and maybe some people are going to get a little bit more because they are the ones working for the company for for this communal company but yeah but have you put this down in that what you put down as your experiences with this project or anything have you put these things down somewhere on paper yes or these yeah. recommendations well, kind of thing huh some kind of recommendations that you might have or something have you put that down because learning from all that have you reached a, one is of course these learning things the points that you put but in terms of this developer this is important also about what you're saying this communal yes, kind of yes, a company it, thing yeah it's important i have done like interviews with people that do this kind of or promoting this kind of communal enterprises um but yeah 
So I tell you, you can see how your session is important because I did not put any session immediately. The next one was was yours was nine o'clock in the morning. The next was eleven o'clock because I know you have so much to so much to bring in. So that's why. But at this point of time, I know it's late. It's beyond midnight for you. So thank you very much, Louis. Really thank nice you, talking to you always. And I'll please join other sessions. The schedule is out there. I'll also send you a link whenever you can because you're definitely you'll add value to it and other discussions also. Okay, so thank my you very friend. much, Louis. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.